All right, so it's only taken a bazillion years, but we are here live on the Atheist Experience. I'm your host, Matt Delaney. Joining me this week, Greta Christina. Yay! It's Bat Cruise Weekend here in Austin, and uh, for those who aren't familiar, why aren't you familiar? Why haven't we, I mean, I've explained a gazillion times that Austin has the largest metropolitan bat population in the world, and every year we rent a boat, we get a couple hundred people out on the boat to drink and watch bats, although yesterday, no bats. No bats. No bats. First time, and I think in the entire time we've done this, we've had some some years it's great, uh, the, the skies are clear and you're able to look at bats, and some years it's a little cloudy, so it's a little harder to see them. And uh, I was busy uh, downstairs inside the boat uh, talking to people, and the next thing I know we had pulled in and somebody came over and said, we're done, there's no bats today. <laughs> oh, no. no. <laughs> but there was other, uh, plenty of other good things. Uh, Greta came over from California, as, as an infiltrator, as <laughs> we discovered last night. That's my plan. Um, to talk a little bit uh, about her new book and some thoughts about atheism, and we'll get into that in just a moment. So we have the Bat Cruise pre-cruise lecture, and this year we also, uh, the Atheist Community of Austin also gave out uh, an award to uh, Rebecca Vitzman, who's sitting right up there on the other side of the glass, yay! Um, and then we do the bat cruise, and then afterwards, you know, people go and hang out, and then we come here to do the show. Yep. And that's how Greta is here. Uh, so, so happy to be here. I'm just delighted. I've been I, wanting to do this for so long, I can't believe we waited this long. It's, it's one of those things, uh, there are, there's like a list of maybe 20 or 30 people that I would desperately love to get on the show, <laughs> and it's, how do, how do I do that? How do we be on the show? I was like, well, you need to be in Austin <laughs> on a Sunday, you know, and, and kind of work it out in advance, and this is, this is awesome. Uh, so there's a bunch of things coming up. So why don't you, I mean, we have, you've written a gazillion books now, because five, four or five is a gazillion. That's exactly, yes. To the yes. guy who has been promising a book for years and still has not finished it. Um, but the latest one is The Way of the Heathen. Uh, the first one was Why Are You Atheists So Angry? That's correct. Yeah, Why Are You Atheists So Angry? 99 Things That Piss Off the Godless. That was my, my first... And I've done, like, edited some anthologies and such, but that was my first book that was just my writing with just my name on it. And that one came from a blog post that became a talk that became the, yes, this is the talk all of us have been <laughs> screaming to, to do, and you did it and turned it into a book. It was amazing. Uh, well, thank you. Yeah, no, it's funny. It's like I wrote that post, the post called, I think, Atheist and Anger, uh, and it had been you know, just this attempt to answer the question, you know, we're always asked, why are you atheists so angry? And it's asked in this kind of obnoxious way, this kind of passive-aggressive way, like, you can't possibly have a good answer to that question, so the answer to that question must be there's something wrong with you. And so I sat down to write down, here's a bunch of the things that atheists are legitimately angry about. And I wrote the post, and I thought it would get a little attention. And I woke up, you know, posted it, woke up the next morning, and like looked at my traffic, and it had gone through the roof. Uh, and was like, oh, I guess people really want to hear about this topic. Uh, so yeah, started uh, giving talks on it. Uh, uh, was actually approached by a publisher to say we want a book about this. Um, so uh, so yeah, and it's funny. It's still my best selling book. It's I mean, whenever I put out a new book, that's my bestseller uh, for a while. Uh, but then once the old book is is behind me for a while, why are you atheist so angry? Still my bestseller. And it it's, it makes sense in a way because it resonates. But the other books that you've done, I think, are also important. I, having the question to why are you so angry, uh, which s spoiler alert, because um, <laughs> it's justified. <laughs> Because there are good reasons to be mildly irritated, if not angry, about some of the things. When you wake up in a world, um, or, or escape from a world where you're in this religious mindset, and you look around, and the majority of people believe things that you view as absurd, and they want to try to police your life with mm -hmm. their beliefs, mm -hmm. I think there's some righteous indignation there. Absolutely. But Greta goes through it in yeah. great detail and yeah. covers them. Yeah. Well, and also... Anger is a motivator. You know, anger is what gets us to change things. You know, anger is what tells us that there's something wrong, either that we're being hurt or that we're being mistreated, or that other people are being hurt, that other people are being mistreated. And I think that's something that's not always understood about atheist anger, is that it's sometimes it's on our own behalf, it's because atheists are being mistreated, but often it's on other people's behalf. We're angry about how believers treat each other. You know, it's not just motivated out of, you know, sometimes it's motivated out of self-interest, and that's valid, but it's also motivated out of compassion and a sense of justice and seeing that the world is terrible sometimes and that we want it to be better. And especially when you believe that this life is it, um, 
at least for me, I am much more motivated uh, to try to make this world better, not just for, for me, but for other people. Tonight. So after that, uh, I, I believe the second one was coming out. Right? Yes, Coming Out Atheist was the next book. That is a topic that we've probably dealt with on this show half a gazillion times. Mm -hmm. um, and you went out and actually either interviewed or, or read the writings of like 400. It was over 400 uh, atheists. Uh, I collected stories on my own blog. I went out to find coming out atheists on other sites because I didn't just want the book to be about, here's how readers of Greta Christina's blog uh, think you should come out and how what their experiences were with coming out. So I did a lot of research finding other sites uh, where people had coming out stories. And, you know, it's not, you know, and I will say up front, I'm not an academic. This wasn't, you know, a... a statistically accurate sampling of atheists or anything like that. I did my best to draw as, as wide a sample as I could. Uh, and so I just read these over 400 stories and started looking for themes. You know, what what are the things that people think they did right when they came out as atheists? What are the things they think they did wrong? Uh, what do they wish they had done differently? And also just how do they feel about coming out? And one of the things that surprised me the most is that so I read over 400 stories about coming out as an atheist, and literally only one person said that they regretted it. Only one person said they thought it was a bad idea. Other people had regrets about how they did it. You know, right. I wish I hadn't done it on Christmas Eve dinner. You know, I, I, I wish I hadn't told my gossipy cousin first, who then told the whole family. You know, I wish I'd waited till I was out of the house um, and wasn't dependent on my family. Uh, people have regrets about how they come out. And that's why I wrote the book. Is like so we people could benefit from other people's experiences of what worked and what didn't. It would be um, interesting to go back because so the one person who literally regretted doing this at all. Yeah. It would be interesting to perhaps talk to them a few other times down the road to see if that regret remains because one of the common themes is you come out, everything goes to hell, <laughs> and you know it's never going to get back to normal, and you've lost all this, and then you get to a new normal, and people kind of mellow on it, and. Uh, you know, there are family members who uh, and friends who cut me off and despised me, and then others who kind of came back and went, okay, well, you still seem to be the, pretty much the same person that I liked before. So, Yeah, and that's actually a good question. People sometimes ask, you know, well, so what's different about the one person? Why did that, why was that one person different? And her story wasn't massively different from other people's stories. You know, she, she lived with her family. She was financially dependent on her family, and that was, I think, one of the things that made it very hard for her. But I do wonder, you know, in five or ten years, is she still going right. to say, I regret that I came out at all? Or is she going to say, coming out was the right decision, my life is better now, but I wish I hadn't done it then. I wish I had, you know, waited until I was independent. Um, and even if it's something that she does continue to regret for the rest of her life, that's an entirely valid yeah. thing. I mean, there are... I, I, love, I would love to say, oh, I have no regrets. I have no regrets from my life. Because... You can look at it in the sense of all those things that happened to me made me who I am today, and as long as I'm okay with that, mm -hmm. you know, do you, do, Matt, do you regret that you were a Christian for 25 years? No, because if I hadn't been, I wouldn't be able to have the discussions that I have now, which I enjoy and, and which helps some people. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, I think there's a context in which regrets are okay because it kind of shows that you've learned something that went wrong so that you don't do it again or change how you deal with it. Sure, absolutely. And that's such a complicated question. You know, it's, like you said, it's, I do have regrets. I do have things that I wish I'd done in my life differently uh, that I would do over if I had them to do over again. You know, at the same time, they're, make, they're who made me who I am now. And I'm, you know, basically happy with who I am now. So that's complicated. So you begin with why are we so angry? Mm -hmm. And then, hey, coming out, how to do it, you know, why to do it. Um, also, I want to add to that, uh, the Coming Out Atheist book isn't just about how to come out. It's about how to support other people in coming out. And there's a lot of people who are already pretty much out. And it's not like being out is an either or thing. It's a spectrum. You know, we're more out or less out. Uh, but for people who are pretty much out, uh, the book has a lot of advice on how to support each other. How do we build communities that are safe for people to come out into? Uh, how can we talk about atheism in a way that makes uh, that makes the world safer for people to come out as atheists? So, And, and so after you tackle those two topics, mm -hmm. you get to a topic that I think... Uh, I, I have a difficulty saying... This is the most important topic because there are so many. Mm -hmm. And 
of the the, ven- the benefits that people get from living a religious life and being in that community, not so much that they're getting it from a god, but from the community yeah. and, and the ideas within there. Dealing with death and grief and loss. I got an email the other day, which I'll be tackling in a video, which I'll keep separate from this, but it was, well, what does atheism have to offer? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and I'll deal with that later this week. <laughs> but one of the areas where I think we've done a disservice to people in general uh, is allowing religion to define what life is and what death is and how to prepare for those things so that, oh, well, um, you know, I, was, I lived a, a life where I was estranged from this person and never tried, to, but I can fix that when I get to heaven sort of right. thing. And, you know, is it okay to mourn? And what are you crying about? And if, you're, if all life is meaningless and all this other stuff, how can you possibly be sad that you've lost someone you cared about? And that's where you came from with this, which is I love the fact that this looks like, I mean, it's a, it's a book. I'm not knocking it like I would knock mm-hmm. Sam Harris for uh, one of his, the letter to a Christian nation, which was a letter. So, I, you know, you bind up a letter. <laughs> but this, comforting thoughts about death that have nothing to do with God, when you see this, you're like, hmm, hey, that not only sounds interesting and important, but I'm pretty sure I could digest this on the flight. It's or, accessible, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, I mean, I think all my books are accessible, but it's true. It being a, a compact book makes it seem like, you know, this is something I could read in a couple of nights. And, yeah. Um, and I do think that we do a disservice by not talking enough about our philosophies of death and our philosophies of how we deal with mortality, how we deal with grief. You know, and a lot of atheists tend to concede that ground to religion. You know, I can't tell you how many atheists I've talked to who have said, you know, there's lots of things that are better about an atheist's life, including, most importantly, that atheism is almost certainly true. And we want our life to be based in reality. But, but, but even atheists who say, you know, there's so much benefit to a secular life, but on the question of death, religion just wins. Of course it would be better to, to believe in God when it comes to death. Of course it would be better to have an afterlife. And I don't actually think that's true. Uh, I do think that secular philosophies of death are, are very comforting, and they have the additional comfort of, again, being almost certainly true. You know, I know when I had spiritual beliefs, I always, there was a, this kind of sense of unease because I knew I was kind of fool, that I was fooling myself. I knew that, I, that it was wishful thinking. And my secular philosophies about grief and mortality, they're rooted in reality and that makes them feel much more safe. And so I do want atheists to talk about this stuff more, to, to really, to discuss how we see death and how we live differently when we know that, that life is really finite. And the broader secular community is doing a better job uh, in a lot of these areas. You have, for example, specifically Grief Beyond Belief and yes. other organizations uh, who have a focus on that area. Mm-hmm. With, with regard to community, you have you know Oasis, Sunday Assembly, all of these things mm-hmm. that ridiculously get labeled as AC Church, as if there's yeah. something wrong with people. Hey, we, we wanted to get together and talk to folks, just like all the people that are sitting on the other side have been sitting out there talking. The whole, mm-hmm. Welcome to church. <laughs> Welcome to the atheist experience church. You are not sufficiently secular. That's, it's nonsense. Uh-huh. But so you write about who we are, how to come out, how to deal mm-hmm. with a really difficult topic, and then you have the audacity. <laughs> who are you, Greta Christina, <laughs> to write a book Telling us how to live our entire lives, lives. <laughs> the way of the heathen, which I absolutely love the cover for, which I'll let you explain and, and talk about. But. Thank you. Uh, so, so yes, I you know this is my latest book, The Way of the Heathen: Practicing Atheism in Everyday Life, and you'll see when you look at the cover that it's kind of a visual joke. That it's it, you know there's so many books that are called the way of the something, the way of the the way of the warrior, the way of the shaman, the way of the whatever, and I was like, what gives people the idea that there's this one right way to live your life and that they can tell it to you. So the cover shows a person walking on a road that branches into many roads. And and that is the idea of this book. There is, of course, not one right way to live our lives. But living as a non-believer is different than living as a believer. You know, we live our lives differently when we accept that there is no God and no afterlife, that this short life is the only one. We, we live our lives differently when we accept that uh, that the bad things and the good things that happen to us are natural cause and effect and human activity and, and not planned by God. 
you know, it, it shapes our lives. And in particular, when people have recently left religion or when they're questioning religion, but also people who have been non-believers for a long time do often struggle with these questions. How do we deal with suffering and death? Uh, what, you know, I've had atheists ask me, what do I say to somebody when they're grieving? Oh, uh, you know, what, you know, I don't know. I was brought up saying, you, I'll, I'm praying for you and it's right. all okay because they're in heaven. Now I don't believe that anymore. What do I say? Um, you know, how do we define morality? Uh, how do we... Uh, how do we form communities? How, how do we build relationships with believers? And, you know, so there's so many different ways. And so this book, it's not like, okay, so there's lots of different ways. Here's the one. Here's the one way. Um, what it is is uh, ideas that can help people uh, make their own decisions, uh, so posing some questions uh, that people can ask themselves when they're considering how to live an atheist life. Um, Offering some suggestions that have worked for other people uh, and, and kind of giving people encouragement on how to select their own path. You're kind of standing at the fork in the road and saying, I talked to some folks that went down this road. There's some other things down this road. Mm -hmm. You know, let me help you maybe think about how you can pick the best road for you. Exactly. Um, and why the best road for you might not be let's run around killing everybody. Yes, yes. I, mean, I think we can agree that that's probably the poor choice yeah, across yeah. the board. Yeah, I should have had a chapter on that. It would have been very short. Don't run around killing people. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's that's. There may not be one necessarily completely right way, but there are some mistakes that you can make, and I would think that killing everybody would be would one be of one them. of them. Yes. I mean, what do I know? <laughs> I'm just a godless heathen. <laughs> yeah. So, so yesterday, when, when uh, so you talked about a number of things yesterday, including there was a discussion about the way the heathen, there was a discussion about labeling. Um, but I think my favorite part, so one of the things is that there's disagreement. Not everybody's going to, hell, you and I don't agree on everything. Sure. Why would we? Yeah. Um, the I don't even agree with myself all the time. That's, <laughs> you know, I change I, my mind or have con I'm confl conflicted. We are in the same boat there. I, <laughs> I, I don't agree with myself probably more than I shouldn't. <laughs> Shouldn't yes, I like yeah. that. So we uh, we uh, this idea that there might be disagreement. Um, we didn't really get into the, and I I don't necessarily mean to go down that road now. The, this idea of uh, how much agreement should there be? How much you know? What are the limits on labels? What are the limits on these other things? But my I think my favorite part of the talk from yesterday, um, which I would like you to maybe touch on a little bit before we get to callers. Um, we, you and I both participated in with Chris Johnson on his book. Um, it was, I think, it's still at the Atheist book, but it also became a film. It's uh, you know, one hundred atheists talking about joy and meaning in a life without God. Yeah, the title is, I think, a better life. A better life. Yes, Chris would come over and smack me for not immediately getting <laughs> yeah. that right. Uh, no, he wouldn't. <laughs> but in that, you have a bunch of people who are living lives without a God belief, without a tie to a religion, we're talking about what makes their life meaningful and valuable. And at the end of yours, you made a case for frivolity, for <laughs> you don't need this grandiose explanation. I, I'd love for you to kind of touch on that before we move on to callers, because I, I loved that. I, I would have given a dozen frivolous answers if it wasn't for the fact that I was sitting there. Oh, let me think of something really impressive really to deep, say. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah. So it's certainly the big things. You know, when when we're asked, you know, how do you have meaning without God? And and even religious believers, you know, will say, you know, what gives your life meaning? Um, you know, we do tend to talk about the big things. You know, we talk about family. We talk about community. We talk about doing good work in the world. Uh, you know, perhaps our jobs, if if we like our jobs, which I realize not everybody does. Um, you know, we talk about the big picture. Uh, you know, art and art and music and you know, love, love and and all of those are actually very, of course, very important, and they're what give my life a lot of meaning. But a huge amount of what gives my life meaning is just little daily pleasures you know you know petting my cat uh, eat, eating a donut you know it's walking down the sidewalk and seeing a nice piece of street art uh, and you know taking pictures of it and putting, putting it on Facebook um, you know d d d a nice song coming up on the shuffle and doing a happy little dance you know the the small pieces of joy are so much of what really make up our, our lives and the, the way that I put it in the book is that um, that joy is the universe 
giving itself pleasure. You know, there's a famous Carl Sagan quote that, you know, we are how the universe uh, learns about itself. I, I forget the exact wording. Uh, we are how the universe knows itself, and that's true, but we're also how the universe experiences pleasure. We're how the universe experiences joy. And sometimes that's the big picture joy, and, and sometimes it's, it's just the really small details. And I, I think a lot of people have had the experience of, you don't necessarily remember the big things. You, you don't remember the, um, you know, I could probably tell you about the day I graduated college. It's a big deal, right? But I don't remember that much about it. But I have this vivid memory of this day that I bit into a peach, and it was a perfect moment in peach season, and that peach was just the perfect peach. And I'm like sitting here remembering that peach right now, and it just, it was, it really framed, um, you know, just it really brought me present into the present moment. And I think that that is a, something of a difference between a secular life and a religious one, is that a religious life, especially if you believe in an afterlife, is very forward driven. You know, you're you're trying to get somewhere else. And often that's true in secular life as well. We have achievements, we have ambitions, we have goals. But this moment, this moment right here is also hugely important and and, and trying to have joyful moments. You know, it's it's not it's not trivial. It's it's the the substance of life. Yeah, I've talked before about how there's a an old older saying about how religion religion poisons you and then offers you the antidote, and I I think that's wrong. I think religion convinces you you're poisoned when you're not, and then offers you the homeopathic non antidote. <laughs> non antidote, yeah. <clears throat> but I think when w one of the things that religion's done that that has certainly poisoned things is, hey, let's talk about meaning and purpose in in life, and you need to have a massively significant you know philosophically profound answer to all this because God seems to be this, you know, significant thing. Oh, the purpose of life is to live, do whatever God wanted us to do. And I, no, uh, by, by convincing people that they need a huge, overwhelming answer, that the trivial things which might accumulate or individually still give meaning to a life, they're just not enough. It's not enough. You need something bigger. Why? Yeah. And, it, and they've done the same thing with grief, mm -hmm. with you know, oh, well, there's an afterlife to go to, and this is the most important thing, which makes the entirety of human experience, uh, we just chuck that out. I mean, that was just a, you know, that was like a blink of the eye. That was, that, that was a practice run. Yeah. That, was a, that was a trial run. Doesn't uh, matter. Yeah, no, I think that's true. And there, it's, you know, when you do believe in, in God, and God is the creator of everything, God has always existed and will always exist and made everything. Um, and if that were true, you know, if that were true, then of course, yes, making God happy would be the most important thing because he's way more important than I am. Um, but it's not true. And it does diminish just sort of the importance of just human experience on the human level. Uh, and and there is, you know, I know from my own experience when I was letting go of, of my spiritual beliefs, I never had conventional religion, but my spiritual beliefs, uh, I did have... There's a loss when you think that your life is contributing to something enormous, mm -hmm. you know, way bigger than you. Uh, but at the same time, there's this tremendous freedom. It's like, oh, I get to decide. I get to decide what's meaningful. You know, and I get to decide that, you know, working to try to make history better 500 years from now, which is something I'm very engaged in doing, uh, that that is important. And I also get to decide that my cat's belly is important. Yeah. On that note, um, so there's a, the calls are already here. The number's at the bottom of the screen, although I think we have full or nearly full lines. Uh, I don't, because we just did the back cruise, I don't think I have any massive uh, major ACA announcements, although you can go to atheist-community.org and there's a schedule of events on the new website and ways to find information about what's going on uh, here locally, including big events where we bring somebody like Greta in to talk, and little events, which are sometimes, no offense to Greta, far more important, where we're, <laughs> people in the organization are building ramps for the disabled who, who need things like that, or doing street cleanups, or feeding the homeless, and, and things in those uh, arenas of humanity. Why would we do things like that? Maybe we'll get a, a call that talks about that. <laughs> but also, after the show's over today, we'll get to get together for dinner at uh, Star of India, and they will have the address right up on the screen, uh, usually before my finger's done swiping. But there it is. I was a little too fast today. <laughs> but let's go ahead and uh, try to take some calls real quick. We've got 
Chi in Georgia, thanks for waiting. Hey. Hello. Hi, how are you? Okay. Um, it seems my voice is echoing and it is affecting my speech. Are you watching the stream or listening to the stream? No, just doing it over my phone. Oh, actually, I think it might be up in the background of the phone. Thank you. Well, anyway, if, if you have a, if you had a question or comment for us, you could just spit it out, and then we could get to it offline if we need to. Ah, uh, no, I think it would take too much time to close it, so I think I'll just ignore it. But um, it seems I am technically religious, kind of grew up Protestant. Uh, I, I can quote chapter and verse, terrible things Moses said, or Moses said God said, or Paul said, and dangerous things Yeshua said, but I still have very much that belief. It seems if I try to say something bad about El Ali Yahweh, I, it, it doesn't work. I feel as if they are there listening to me with me right now as I'm talking to you, and I feel nervous. What, why do you think that is? The case um almost definitely if i try to reason with myself because i was brought up with the belief the spirit in the bushes or putting agency to why lightning struck that tree um it, it doesn't change that i that I believe it, though, that I really do think they're there, even though I think I shouldn't think they're there. Okay. Um, I'd like to speak to that, actually. Sure. Um, so I've talked with a lot of non-believers, mostly, uh, about their process of, of letting go of belief. And something that's important to note about it is it is often a process. Uh, it, it's very, almost never when you ask people, why do you no longer believe in God? How did that happen? Almost never do people say, somebody made a really persuasive argument once. You know, I watched one episode of The Atheist Experience. I read one book by Greta Christina, and, and that was it. Um, there is often a process, and what you're describing of, sort of, it sounds like what you're saying is intellectually knowing that there aren't, that there's not a good reason to believe in God, but still having some sort of emotional experience uh, of it. That's actually pretty common, and something that might be worth doing is talking with, um, in particular, talking with other non-believers who have had a similar experience to you, and making sure at the outset, if you don't want them to try to talk you out of it, you just really want to hear what their experience was. Um, that might be helpful in having you just sort of parse out, you know, is it that I have this emotional experience because it was just brought up with it my entire life and those are hard to let go of? Um, if you talk with other people, and it might also be worth talking with open-minded believers, open-minded theists, who are also perhaps having doubts and are having similar things, um, because you know, the reality is you've been programmed. You know, you've been socially programmed to have these beliefs. You've been taught these beliefs your whole life, probably from a young age. And that doesn't disappear overnight. Um, and sometimes it does take a certain amount of social reinforcement uh, to... No, and not necessarily it's like you're going to go to people and say, change my mind, argue me out of this. But just if you're surrounded by people, whether that's in person or online, um, who don't believe and who can say, yes, I know what that experience is like to sort of still have that feeling and still have those fears, still have, especially you're taught your whole life that you're being watched. I, I, I wasn't brought up with that kind of religion. I can't imagine how just paranoid that would make you feel. Um, <laughs> um, so it, the, what I found is that the more we talk with other people about these experiences, the more safe it feels uh, to really explore the question, not just intellectually, but emotionally, of what do we really believe? And I, I, if I can ask like a couple of quick questions that might, I don't know, might be helpful, might not. <clears throat> so yeah, and it seems it, I haven't addressed the description yet, too. I apologize for that. Well, it, it, it seems from the description from what you said that you're in this position where 
you are con you recognize on some intellectual level that you don't perhaps have a good reason to believe that these things are true, and yet you cannot avoid, because belief isn't a choice, uh, feeling like they're true and feeling you know if you, you you've read through the Bible and you found a bunch of things that you object to, and if in fact this God being was real, you know he seems to be some sort of moral monster, uh, and yet you, you are afraid to. To voice those concerns because it feels like somebody's watching. Is that pretty close to what you're talking about? Um, kind of. What is the description you have for my call? Religion, suicide, and sexuality believes in the Christian God, but does not really like the character. <laughs> yeah, it seems I I was going to be a preacher, and I believe that God gave me a socially unaccept a socially unacceptable sexuality for that reason. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm kind. I'm trying very hard, listening to Aaron Raw, Christopher Hitchens, you, and many, many others, to get myself out of the mindset. But after I came to the conclusion that even if there is that entity, if it if it is there, I I am not going to preach on it. If I can't preach an entire book in the Bible, I don't intend to preach on part of that book because if I don't want them to read that entire book, I I. I don't want to encourage it. But if the God does exist, I can't be a preacher for it. If the God doesn't exist, I have a socially unacceptable sexuality, and that is very scary to me. Well, so I, I, I can mostly appreciate that. Um, I, it, it, the answers that I have um, and I don't mean that to be glib, would probably be unhelpful. It's like, oh, actually, there's, while there may be some people in society who find your sexuality uh, unacceptable, screw them. Uh, but I, I know that's not a useful thing because you still have to deal with the people that you have to deal with. But on, on the God front, for me, I could believe that there was some sort of God and still not worship it and not want anything to do with it, depending on what its character is. And if, and if I read through uh, the writings for this, whether it's, it doesn't matter to me whether it's a god or a king or the neighborhood watch, the person who's in charge of the neighborhood watch, if, if they're an asshole, uh, I may be convinced that they exist, but that's completely separate from whether or not I respect them or would adhere to their particular rules. But when it comes to the feeling that you can't even, ex like, if the neighborhood watch guy is not here right now and isn't actually watching the show, and I don't know who it is and I don't have anything against my neighborhood watch guy, but <laughs> if I was sitting here and it was just the two of us or the three of us having a conversation without being on TV, I would feel completely comfortable talking about that person, you know, what my problems are with them, and never feel that I'm being spied on. And even if I thought I was being spied on, I might still voice my concerns. But I'm not everybody, and I don't get to make decisions about how you're going to, to live your life and, and what is or isn't comfortable for you. It's just, if on an intellectual level you don't think that this is likely, then what really seems to me to be happening here is something that is entirely fear-based. And if the God that you think is spying on you and judging you <laughs> is also a God uh, that, it, that would, does so through fear and intimidation rather than openly and honestly communicating with you about what its wishes are, then that God is undeserving of worship or admiration in the first place. So you either have a God that you are better off rejecting even if he does exist or a God that doesn't exist. Uh, but well, it, to me, and, I, and I'll let you get right to this, to me, both of those are kind of secondary issues. There's the intellectual pursuit of, hey, do I believe this or, or, or not? Uh, what's far more uh, troubling for me is you, you've set up a scenario where you are constantly struggling with yourself. You are struggling with yourself, hey, I don't think I should believe this, but it certainly feels like I'm being watched. And I don't think there's anything wrong with my sexuality, but boy, that you know, the social circles I run in seem to think there is, and the fear that there might be a God who intentionally made me this way, uh, and then looks down on me for being made look to look that way. There's a level of contradiction where I hope 
that you, like a lot of other people, get to a point where you can say, fuck that, I'm going to be me. And if, if somebody made, if there was a God who made me, uh, gave me a brain to use and then said, you don't get to use that on these topics, <laughs> he's an ass. <laughs> And if, if there's a God who, you know, created me with a particular sec sexuality and then said, I'm going to stick you down in this world surrounded by people who are ig ignorant and fearful and, you know, look at you negatively, um, well, he's, th that's an ass who set you up to, to fail. And the way to beat that is to go ahead and succeed. The way, the way to do that is say, you know what, I'm going to be me and I don't buy into your you know, notion of what's wrong with me. Um, I'd actually like to jump in here for a minute because I, I can speak to the experience of having a, a socially unacceptable sexuality. I'm bisexual, pansexual technically actually. Um, uh, and the great thing about being bisexual is that you're looked down on by both straight people and gay people, so that's awesome. Uh, I'm kinky, uh, I'm polyamorous and polysexual actually, but I don't want to get into the whole complicated thing. Um, so yeah, and it's, and I, there's a part of me that agrees with Matt that ultimately we have to say, you know, screw society, but we also have to live in society. And, you know, it's like, you, you know, we do have to worry uh, to some extent as sexual minorities about, you know, I don't have to care about what other people think of me in terms of do I care about their opinion, you know, because I, I, I know that my sexuality is ethical. And as long as your sexuality is ethical, that's, that's what matters. Um, but, you know, we have to worry about things like, is it going to make it harder to find a job? You know, is it going to make it harder to, uh, to get a place to live? Am I going to get kicked out of my house? You know, yeah, is my landlord going to be a bigot? You know, and so we do actually have to deal with, you know, sexual minorities do actually have to deal with those issues. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to say, you know, just, you know, who cares what they think? Because we do, unfortunately, have to care what they think. Um, but... You know, so, you know, this is part of me that's like, I see that you live in Bowen, Georgia, move to Atlanta. You know, like, um, yeah. Seriously, I, I am not kidding. Um, that is one of the best things that you can do that's, if you have a life that people look down on is surround yourself you with people. Me? Yes, I can. Surround yourself with people who accept you the way you are. Okay, there are three things. I'm going to try to be very quick. It seems the first thing was to Matt regarding um, the fear thing. The fear thing's actually a little bit more than that. Um, I, I'm a bit autistic, and it seems as long as I was on the path of being a preacher and a good and faithful servant, um, things seemed to go amazingly, excellently well, as if nothing bad could touch me. And after I started to betray that position, it was any time I was able to force something to go well, without exception, the very next day, that thing that I forced to go well would figuratively collapse to the point of three years of homelessness. I'm out of that now. I have a job. I nearly lose it about every month. And it's very easy to say that perhaps that's just because of things I'm a little bit bad at or a little bit socially off at because of autism, but it's also very hard to ignore the timing of when things started to go wrong and the fact that it continues to go wrong. It feels like I am being punished or detour, detoured or things like that. Um, but the, there's a lot of potential problems there. Not only do you have a, a limited data set, which is completely biased, but if you have been basically instructed that as long as you are trying to serve God, things will go well, then you are going to see things as going well. And if you are convinced that as soon as you betray God, things are going to start going wrong, you will see things going wrong, and you may be act working to sabotage yourself subconsciously on some occasions. Um, and you might just be picking, you know, let's, let's focus more on the things that are going wrong now than on the things that are going right. I can't say because, you know, I'm not living your life. And, and the, the thing that I, I wanted to mention about Greta thing, I'm not saying... Screw society, I'm going to do my own thing. We have to deal with society. The point was, to the extent that one could say, I'm not going to worry about what society thinks. I think one should be far more worried about society thinks than whether or not there is potentially some God being who's also spying on you. Because we know society <laughs> is real. So let's focus on the part that we know to be real. And, and there you have a couple of different options. You, you ha as Greta suggested, you, know, you might be able to find a new place to live which has you know, different social circles. Um, you could say, screw it, I'm living my life. Or you could find other ways to, to make this work. 
But I think if you're oh, right. it, if you're in this if you're in this mindset that oh when I was trying to be a preacher everything went right and now that I'm not everything's going wrong, um, that may be the first thing to address. And I'm not like arguing for the power of positive thinking or the secret or any of that crap, but it seems that how we think about what we're doing with our life um, changes our attitudes and can change how we view what's happening to us. You know, I remember when I lost my job back in 2000, 2001 or whatever, uh, I thought God was punishing me. <laughs> I was absolutely convinced that I, you know, God wanted me to be a preacher, and I said, no, I'm not going to be a preacher. I'm going to go off and do, you know, computer hardware and software and eight years in the Navy and this other stuff. And focused on my secular life, the things that I valued. And everything, by the way, was going really well right up until it stopped going well. And as soon as it didn't, I said, okay, God is punishing me. God, God wanted me to preach. And when I refused, he let me build up a career and then he snatched it all away. <laughs> and that's how I got to where I am now. Um, the worst, I, the most despondent I've ever been probably is during that period of time that I thought I had failed God and God was punishing me and I'd better do everything I could to get back on the right track. And the best point of my life is pretty much right now where I am I'm myself, I'm not beholden to anybody, I am talking about what I think and what I know and, and what I don't know. Um, and I, I can't, I don't know that either of us are going to be able to give like, here's what you need to do. Uh, no, I, I, I can't. Uh, I certainly can't do that. I mean, I will, can certainly say I'm, I'm really sorry you're going through that, and, and, and I get it. You know, that's, that's really hard. I, I, what I do think is that we, we have a tendency to view things through, through lenses. Um, and if things were, and it's in particular, it's really easy to look at past times in our lives and say, oh, it was so great, everything was perfect then, and to it forget always. about all the things that were, that were actually difficult and stressful. You know, it, it's, it's easy to filter out those memories. Uh, and if you're going through something stressful, which, you know, the reality is that it's not true for everybody, but sometimes questioning religious belief and, and being in the process of letting go of it, that can be stressful. It can be stressful emotionally. It can be stressful in terms of your relationships with other people. Uh, then you're going to phrase, you know, sort of view everything through that lens. And I'm not saying you're wrong. You know, your life is actually just as good now as it was then. Um, I'm just saying it's... You know, one of the cognitive biases we have is is to think in, that everything is cause and effect and that everything is caused by somebody. And one of the hardest things to let go of uh, when we are letting go of religious belief or questioning it is to realize sometimes just stuff happens. And... Hey. <laughs> yep. Um, since so much time has gone by, instead of getting to the other two things... Can I tell you what got me out of it real, real quick, or uh, even if I'm not fully out of it, what got me out of the idea of being a preacher or a good and faithful servant? Sure, you, you can go ahead and do that, and then we'll move on to some other callers. Okay, so when I was really little, it was obvious that I, I'm not sure if they knew that I was at autistic yet, but they wanted me to act a certain way. So um, I, I think it was that there was a roach in a sibling's room. And they put some bug spray in my hand and then told me to go uh, uh, spray it, to be a good big brother and uh, take care of the roach. And it actually was a really damaging thing for me to see, because not knowing what it was, where I just sprayed it, and then I saw it doing all of these things to try to get what I had sprayed onto it off and then die. And, and I guess I became somewhat of a pacifist from that and found out about USDA studies indicating crabs feel pain or flies act erratically when pressured by threats, suggesting some sort of emotion. And that kind of, of setup of pacifism, it, it, all it took was something in the Bible to show me, oh, that's so much worse than my standards this is a really bad thing, and, and and it can't be a good thing. It can't possibly be a good thing. Even with me not being able to know a tenth of a billionth of a billionth of a Googleplex of what there is to know, um, 
it is not logically possible for these things in each section of the Bible to be good. And if God did that, then God can't be, oh, gosh, I can't be a preacher anymore. This isn't good. <laughs> well, I tell you what, because we're, we're, uh, we've are we run into some time constraints and everything else, I appreciate the call. Uh, I hope things continue to improve. I, I would point out that just from what you've said, uh, and, you know, like we said, we can't live your life. If you had spent three years homeless and now you are beyond that and actually employed, the things seem to be improving at least in some regards. Uh, and that I, I hope you continue to think about these things and that you, you find uh, some peace with, you know, who you are and, and your sexuality and find a way to deal with the things that are causing you difficulties. Uh, because the God thing, while it's what I talk about the most, <laughs> In some cases, it's going to be the most important thing. If it were the truth that God existed, I can't think of anything more important to know or understand. And yet, still, I would point out uh, that uh, if it turns out that this God is not a is a monster or isn't a humanist, then I don't want anything to do with him, and I'm not overly concerned with that in my life. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why I'm a fan of of the way a lot of Reformed Jews tend to focus on the here and now mo far more than the spiritual and, and the supernatural. Um, but, you know, it, keep, keep working on your life and keep thinking and, and try to do what you can to eliminate the biases and perhaps look into possibilities that maybe I'm sabotaging myself without thinking about it. Uh, and just being consciously aware of that might help fix some of it. But neither of us are uh, psychologists or experts in any of these things. And, and really, all we can tell you is what we think. Okay, thank you for taking such a long call. Sure, thank you, G. It's, uh, I was really, you know, when the original list there was, mm -hmm. it was like uh, religion, suicide, and spirituality. The one that I wanted to get to the most out of concern was suicide. Right. Uh, but I'm at least comforted that she seems to be uh, not only a pacifist, which mm -hmm. I, I think as a pacifist you would be opposed to suicide as well, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, Thinking about things and working and caring about making your life better is, has got to be one of the important starts down a particular path. So, yeah. Well, and absolutely, you know, the stuff he was talking about, about having the compassion for the cockroach he's spraying, you know, which, you know, and that, that story just really touched me. And, and I get it. And it is one of the things that I actually struggle with is that having compassion I mean, I wouldn't want to not have compassion. You know, it's, it, compassion is what connects us. It's, it's, you know, it's what keeps us from being isolated. You know, at the same time, there is so much suffering in the world. There's human suffering, there's animal suffering, there's cockroach suffering. And, you know, we do have to make decisions about, you know, I can't feel all that pain or I'm just going to explode. Um, and and that is difficult to manage, you know. And I don't I don't have a magical answer for it, uh, except to say that you know we we all struggle to find that balance, you know, within ourselves every day. That and when I talk to religious people who say, "Oh, the answer is Jesus," <laughs> uh, thank you for your platitude. Let me get back to fixing my life. Yeah. Uh, all right, Min in Oakland, California. Thanks for waiting. Hello, Matt. Hello, Greta. Hi. Yeah, I thank you so much for taking my call. I'm really happy that you are here today because um, the, the the topic I want to discuss uh, with you and Matt. I mean, you are like exactly the candidate to answer my question. Oh, good. Okay. And just, just do me a favor, man, because we've talked about this before. Yeah. Do, do not assume that God put Greta here as the perfect person <laughs> to answer your question. Oh, of course not. I mean, that's just my... Well, you say of course you know, not, but th I have to say that that's been the track record for the past couple of calls. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. No problem. Um, so I think, um, so you know, like uh, four years ago, you know, when I got my uh, first job, um, my boss, he treated me very well, and then um, and, and everything went well with... Uh, uh, my work, and uh, he said, you know, if I feel I am ready to move on to something else, and just do it. Uh, he will give me good reference. So and then, uh, and then after working for him for a few months, I got a new offer, and then I, I was about to leave, but then something happened on Sunday, and when I was driving home from my uh, second work, and it's changed my attitude forever. Um, so 
I go into a, a traffic on the road. I drive home regularly every week, and it never happened before. And you know me, I tend to interpret, like, you know, something uh, predetermined. Uh, so I saw the sign of the um, um, the direction road leading to the Unitarian Church at that time, and then I thought, well, is it probably a coincidence, or maybe the universe will want me to tell me something? So I went to that church, and then the topic on that day, the minister talked about um, gratitude and simple living. And so he quoted the passage in Matthew chapter 6, you know, um, when Jesus talked about um, uh, not uh, storing things on earth. Right. And then he told me the story, yeah. And then he told the story about, um, you know, the philosophy and the teacher who bring the book into the classroom with rocks, pebbles, and sand. I guess you know the story, right? I'm not sure. I, I was having a hard time understanding that. Oh, and yeah, so the philosophy for professor bring into the classroom a bucket, and he filled the bucket with, uh, with rocks. And he asked the student, you know, do you think this bucket is full? And the students say yes. And then he uh, put the pebbles um, between the rocks, and he shake it, and the pebbles fill the, the sure. bucket. Yeah, and, and then and, you can uh, add water. Yeah, and sand, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in yeah. So in the end, um, so after that story, the minister said, you know, you know, just reflect to through your life. You know, uh, um, the book that rep represents uh, your life, and then the rock represents your hell. Um, uh, you know, your passion in, in things that you love, and your relationship. And the pebble represents your work, your, your school, and then the sand or the water represents trivial things like money and so on and so on. And okay. then he said, uh, you know, yeah, go ahead. I'm just, so for, for me, the moral of the story is the students were wrong every time they said, yes, the bucket was full. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's, it, stories like that, Sure, we tell stories that can have an impact, that can give you a different perspective on things. Hey, you think your life's full, but maybe there's something else you can add to it uh, that doesn't fit this particular... Uh, what, what I'm wondering, though, is um, you were calling in to talk about something that is a, a unique benefit of, of your religion, and you expressed concern that you might have been... Uh, you are prone to thinking things that are predetermined or the universe is looking out for you, which is why I cautioned you about thinking that about Greta, <laughs> but yeah, I, I'm trying. I, I'm trying to figure out yeah. exactly what point you're trying to get to. Yeah. So after that sermon was over, I walked to the, my car and then I saw because it was like the changing between uh, summer and the fall, and then I saw like three leaves on my car, and then you know like there's a mix between the yellow leaves and the green leaves, and then. Uh, when I walked in my car, I saw like the wind blow it off of my car, and then I don't know for some weird reason, I the passage from Ecclesiastes number three, chapter three, up in my head, and then I thought, okay, I understand now. Everything's like here is for a reason. So, and and nothing in in life is permanent. So I should appreciate what I have with my relationship with my boss. And, you know, instead of, you know, looking for a higher paying job, and I may not be happy. And then, you know, from then, that moment on, then I I only acquire things that I need and not what I want. And I have time to read more things and learn more things. And on Sunday, I have time chatting with you guys and not, uh, you know, be at work like I used to. So that's why I say it's helped me. Um, you know, change my life uh, for better. Okay, so <laughs> that's why I think it, it, it's unique. Yeah. So, so you you said that. It was perfect that I was on the show. So can I jump in on this? By okay. all means. Um, yeah, so, so I used to have not traditional religious beliefs, but spiritual beliefs. And one of the things I definitely believed in was this sort of signs and patterns in the universe. Everything, like you said, everything happens for a reason. And, you know, if, you know, the book that fell on the floor is the book that I'm meant to read. Or, you know, if I happen to run into an old friend uh, and they tell me a piece of news, well, that was obviously you know, meant to be the message I was supposed to read, to, to, to receive that day. And, yeah. you know, so 
once I let go of those beliefs, once I started understanding that our brains are wired by evolution to do that. Our brains are wired, and for very good evolutionary reasons, to see patterns. And sometimes the patterns are really there, and sometimes they're not. But our brains are literally, and there's tons of research on this if you want to look it up. There's so much, re much research showing that we see randomness and invent narratives uh, to explain them. And so, so here's what happened after I let go of, of those beliefs, of thinking the universe is trying to tell me something, the universe is trying to send me messages. I still sometimes had those feelings. You know, I was like, I remember actually a funny example is uh, my wife Ingrid and I were trying to decide whether or not to get ice cream. And yeah. when we're trying to decide, a parking spot opened up in front of the ice cream shop. And we're like, oh, you know, and that part of me that thinks everything happens for a reason and there's patterns is like, well, the universe is telling me that I should have ice cream. But really what it was, was that's my brain sending me messages about what's important for me. And that's a small example. Obviously, what it really was, was my brain, well, I want to have ice cream and we want to do this. And so... I'm interpreting this, the, the signs of the world to say, you know, yes, have ice cream. But that can be true for bigger things. It sounded like you needed more simplicity in your life. You needed, you know, to not be working two, if I understand your story correctly, you needed to not be working two jobs so that you could get more stuff. You needed to simplify your life. Yeah. You don't need to believe in signs from the universe. To, to think to think that you can just make that decision and you can even say you know it's amazing that I oh hang on this went out for a second you know you can even say you know it's really amazing that I heard this story at a time when I really needed to hear it but you heard probably a hundred stories that day that was the one that resonated with you you knew probably heard stories on the radio you heard stories on TV you saw stories on social media um, and those weren't the stories that resonated with you. The one that resonated with you was the one about simplifying your life. So I think you can take responsibility for that. You can own that. You don't have to believe that somebody else is telling you to do it. You know, does that make sense? There's also, how many other stories and sermons might you have possibly heard that you would have read significance into? You know, how many other churches could you have potentially gone to where there was some sermon that you could take something out of it? The purpose of a sermon is to give messages of significance to people, and if they are sufficiently vague and positive, everybody's going to... I could go to any church in town and, and pick out things that are good. I can read through the Bible and pick out things that are good. The problem with this thinking that the universe is, is guiding you toward something... Uh, and I'll, I'll use Greta's ice cream as, as an example. If I'm looking, trying to decide whether or not I want to get ice cream and a parking spot opens up, let's assume for a second that that is God or the universe or someone or something sending me a message. Is it a good message? Am I just saying I really wanted ice cream and it's, I got this? Maybe the universe is out to kill me. I'm diabetic. <laughs> So the, the, the point is, even if it were the case that God or the universe is trying to send you a message, the message is completely separate from the messenger. You don't get to just assume, oh, the universe is telling me something, therefore it must be good, or God is telling me something, therefore it must be good. You have to assess the message itself. Then, first of all, I agree, there may not actually be a message. This may be you and your brain uh, creating this message. But if, if God tells me, right now to go eat some ice cream I wonder about his intentions because that's not the best <laughs> advice for an overweight diabetic dude to just go pound. and I probably will have the ice cream by the way because I'm weak that way but, the, but the, the point is if you're if you're living your life trying to see messages you're gonna find them and more important than finding them is figuring out whether those messages are good or not whether they are in fact messages that came from someone or, or not is, is secondary. Because if, if, if a good person tells you do this and the advice that they're giving is good, then the advice is good. If a bad person tells you to do this and it's good advice, it's still good advice. And if nobody is telling you this but you've managed to suss out this message, 
that came from nobody other than perhaps you, you still have to figure out whether or not yeah. it's a good message. Well, and speaking from many, I don't know why this is, there we go, is that better? Speaking from uh, many years of experience, as somebody who did tend to look for patterns and, uh, you know, and find them and, and assume that it was a message from the universe, my life was kind of aimless when that was true because I was always, I, I didn't think that I was responsible. You know, I thought I'm just following this path and of course it was really me choosing the path. Of course it was really me deciding which of the thousand messages I get every day is significant and how to interpret it. Um, you know, it's like the parking spot opens. Well, how do I know that that was really that it wanted me to go ice cream? Maybe, maybe the universe wanted me to go buy vegetables at the store next door to the ice cream shop. It's just that I was thinking about ice cream at the time. And when we accept that it is us who's deciding which messages are important, when we accept that it's us who's deciding what lessons are important, you know, we walk into a a church or a, a synagogue or a atheist meetup and we hear things and something resonates with us, we need to take responsibility for is this really how I want to live my life? And you know, my life was very aimless when I thought somebody else was directing it. And once I started accepting, no, I'm really the one. You know, I'm the one who thinks that this message out of the hundreds of messages I'm getting that day, that this is the one that's important, that this is the one that means something to me, and that that I think is good and right. Um, there's that's a massive when my rationalization there. Yeah. There's, there's a massive rationalization mm -hmm. going on. And here's the thing. It may be the case that you turning down the better paying job was the right decision for you, that ultimately you are happier with this. But it might also be the case that turning down that job was a mistake. You might have taken that other job, gotten higher pay, and found joy and meaning and found that your life was better. But in order to alleviate the concern in the back of your mind, oh my gosh, should I have taken that other, oh my gosh, seeing and believing that the universe has given you a message about being happy with what you have yeah. ends that discussion in your head. And that's why you know, you're, you're willing to look at it as a good thing. Hey, I don't have to worry about that anymore because the universe gave me a message. Well, I think that what that ends up doing is preventing you and everyone else, and just picking on men, um, from trying as hard as possible to objectively analyze what's going on in your life, to remove as much bias and preference as you can, and say, you know what, it may have been a mistake to turn down that other job, but I am okay with the decision, I'm comfortable with it, um, and the next time something like this comes up, I will make sure that I don't just say no to something that might be better and continue rationalizing that I'm happy with what I have. I'll try to evaluate that as objectively as possible as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I understand what you and Greta say. It makes sense to me that I guess the thing is that usually when I read an article that talked about how gratitude can make, you know, like lower the blood pressure and make us healthier and less stressful and so on. So it explained from a scientific um, perspective, but it did, it did not really knock into my head until I realized seeing the message in the context of a, of a spiritual or religious, I don't know, connotation. Um, so that's why I make my decision, you know, based on that context and not on, you know, it's not I read a, a biological textbook and then I got um, decision, you know, okay, I should, you know, simplify my life, you know, live, you know, like a, a better way, you know, yeah. So, and I'm not quite sure I completely understood that. It seemed like the scientific evidence wasn't enough. You needed the spiritual motivation as well. Is that what you're saying? Well, because the article that talked about how gratitude can, uh, you know, like alter the chemistry in our brain and make us like more content with our life and make like uh, have, uh, our blood pressure like uh, lower and make us happy. So it explains, um, you know, what it does, but it doesn't actually tell me, you know, you know what I should do or until I, you know, I hear it in the in a in a religious context and somehow I got. I guess in my mind, it's kind of pick up the, the, the message more effectively. 
Well, well, I think Matt has a good point that if you have any kind of tendency towards religious or, or supernatural belief, it is easier in some ways to, to rationalize our choices, to accept our choices and move on with them when we think, you know, God has made this for the choice. So it was obviously the right decision, right? Because God knows everything. And of course, that's highly questionable whether God actually, if yeah. God existed, whether God is actually all knowing and, and all good and, and so on. Um, but it, it, is a, it is a way of giving the choice over to somebody else. It's a way of pretending that the choice is not really yours. Um, and, and that can make it easier to rationalize. It can, you know, certainly living a life where we accept that our choices are ours, you know, and obviously some of them aren't. There's things that are foisted on us by the world. Um, but that, the, that when we do make choices, that there are choices, you know, there is the burden of responsibility. You know, there is, you, you have to really live with, okay, this was my decision. And if it turns out wrong, I can't blame God or think, oh, I got the message wrong from God. But that's such a, that, at least in my experience, it is such a frustrating way to live. You know, I'm like trying to find the messages. You know, if things do go wrong, and they often do, you know, life, life is full of ups and downs. Then I'm wondering, well, well, was it my fault? Did I hear the message wrong? You know, was it, was it God or the world soul or whatever? Uh, were, did they have some other thing that they wanted me to do, some, some lesson they were trying to teach me? And what the heck is it? Um, the problem with the ideas yeah. of karma means that you deserve every bad thing that happens to you. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You can't just focus on the good things mm-hmm. and say, oh, this is the universe looking out for me. You, you know, the universe is trying to kill you as well, type of thing. Yeah, and you have to feel guilty about that or like it was, it was your fault. And, and life is like this process of trying to find signs and, you know, as opposed to just saying, I'm going to make these decisions myself. Oh, Matt, um, because you mentioned about um, I cannot just appreciate a good thing, ignore a bad thing. And actually, you know, after that incident, um, I sometime later that I got sick and then I got a flu and had to be home like uh, for 10 days. Mm -hmm. And then when I got got back to work, um, I had this patient who was really angry because she was the last patient and the line was really long. So she lashed out at me and then I still smiled at her. But when I brought her, her made her medication, so I couldn't help the tears in my eye because I talked to her doctor earlier and then she was on, so the doctor told me she was a hospital patient and she did not have long time to live. So then when she saw me like almost crying, she said, I didn't mean to get upset at you. I just upset with this circumstance that I had to stand here so long to pick up my med. I told her that, no, I, I want to, I feel I couldn't help my tears because I talked to your, to your doctor earlier. I know your condition, and I have just recovered from my flu, and I could understand you know, the pain you're going through. So, so that's why I, that's why I feel that way. So, and then three weeks later on, and then her family come and give me a, a card and say, you know, thank you, and then because her, so then her mom passed away, and then she said the, the most. The last beautiful experience she gets is with a kind technician who gives her comfort word. So therefore, I take every day, I pray for, for the time that I got sick. Because I got sure, sick, but those I are, those are pain, all, so, you know, I feel the pain, you know. All of that is there. just part of the human experience. I, I, I know that you have a propensity to just read more into it. Uh, yeah. I don't. And whenever yeah. we try to get to why, what justification there could be to read more into it, you don't really have an explanation. You, you acknowledge that you don't really have, this is just what you do. Uh, this is what you tend to do. It is this, uh, this bias that you have. And like I said before we talked, you're mm-hmm. probably a decent person. Uh, I really, personally, on a personal level, I wish you would stop reading things into it without justification. But if that's what it takes uh, to encourage you to continue looking on the bright side of life and being and, and caring about other people in the interactions, uh, well, you're not on the evil list, and you're, you're definitely not on my enemy list. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I would actually just like to say, you know, I know those feelings of, like, you know, something bad happened, and but then it turned out, something turned out well, and feeling grateful, you know, that, yeah. you know, that the bad thing, you can feel that. 
without believing that it was done intentionally. You know, you, I can feel, wow, it sure was lucky as it turned out. I thought this was going to turn out badly, but actually it turned out pretty well. It was a, it was a good thing that I did that thing. Um, or it was a good thing that this bad thing happened to me randomly and I got sick at a bad time. You can have those feelings. It's not like being an atheist makes you not have experiences of gratitude. It's not like uh, it makes us not have feelings of good fortune. Um, you know, of, of feeling like, of of feeling happy and and accepting of, of our lives as they are. We can feel that without feeling like it is being guided on purpose. Although I think I think that there is, and I hate to say this and have it be the last thing, <laughs> I think there's an incredibly dark side to all of this that people are overlooking, and that is if the universe conspired to offer you a job that you then turned down and then conspired to have you go the right road to get to this particular church to hear this particular sermon that means the universe is tweaking every little aspect of everybody's life either because you are the one sole important individual who needed to get this or it's manipulating and tweaking your life too and now we are all just puppets on strings of the universe and the message you got becomes irrelevant and so for me I, I would far, I feel far more comforted by the idea that the universe doesn't give a damn about me and that some things happen and we look at them and view them as good and some things happen and we look at them and view them as negative and we can sometimes turn negatives into positives. Hey, I got a flat tire on the side of the road and somebody stopped and helped me and then we made a new connection and now I've got a new friend and that leads to, that's just the way the, the world works. If you try to read too much yeah. into it, what you do is you diminish any input or significance you might possibly have within that framework. Also, yeah. um, I would like to add to that that if you know God really is, you know God or the world soul or whatever, really is just pulling all these strings. He's like paying attention to, oh, I should open up the parking place in front of Greta so she can get the ice cream. But he's letting orphans die of starvation in Rio de Janeiro. You know, he's letting people die of AIDS. You know, all over the world. Um, you know, he's letting people kill each other for no good reason. Um, you know, he's letting you know. You know, police shoot black people, you know, who haven't done anything for just sitting in their cars. You know, he's letting war, he's letting famine, he's letting drought. But he opened up a parking space for me, so that's awesome. You know, it's, I can't believe in a God who is pulling every single string to give us messages and yet lets horrible things happen. It is, you know, much more... You know, comforting, and mostly it's more comforting because it's. I think it's more likely to be true. But you know, when we accept that, that just the world is is natural cause and effect, and and sometimes it's terrible, and sometimes it's great, and we have cer certain degree of power to shape goodness out of it, although that power is limited. You know, yeah. I would much rather believe that than believe in a God who opened up a parking place for me, but is letting people starve to death. And on that, yeah. on that note, man, we've got to get on to some other callers before we run out of time. But I appreciate the call, and I'm sure we'll hear from you again. Um, can I say one quick thing that will sure. uh, be off, man? Uh, yeah, so I, I want to thank you so much for taking my call. I hope you keep doing the show because next time I'll call in, I will tell you, you know, why I'm reluctant to embrace law, logic and reasoning. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you that, that explanation later. But the thing is because I know that even though I do a good thing and I'm not on the enemy list, but because I know that uh, compared to fundamentalists, I'm not different from them. I'm, I'm still exercising belief and well, I'll give you in, I'll give you fair personal. warning. Before you call in to explain to me why you don't trust logic and reason, you yeah. might want to sit down and figure out how you could make an argument against logic and reason without using logic and reason. <laughs> but we'll talk about uh, that next time. Thanks, man. <laughs> I, I don't. I, I don't get that. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's one of those things where, oh, there's the universe has a message. It either puts you in the position of being irrelevant or arrogant. Yeah. Um, and you, you can't overlook it. Now, I'm not a big fan of the problem of evil as as a as as a counter to gods, even gods it might apply to, because I think there are, are better cases. But I realize that it does have an emotional appeal for people. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh! There's people starving and dying every day, and yet you know he helped the Lakers win. Yeah, <laughs> you know he found my car keys. Keys, yeah. <laughs> uh, to to my planet killing beast that I drive around town, uh, and I can say that as I actually own a planet killing beast. It has its own gravity. Uh, 
it's I understand the appeal of that. No. Uh, what I don't understand is uh, the reasoning behind it. And when you know Greta, Greta talked about, she'd rather believe this. And I've also said things like I'd rather believe. Mm -hmm. And it's worth pointing out to the people who are getting ready to email what you'd rather believe is irrelevant. Uh, whether or not something is true or likely to be true or has a good foundation of reason behind it is the key, mm -hmm. which is what we're both actually talking about. Right. Because we'd fact, rather believe the things that are true. That are true. And in <laughs> fact, one of the main reasons why I would rather believe in physical cause and effect than, or rather accept, I should say, the reality of physical cause and effect than a world that's giving me signs is is the fact that it's true means I know how to function in it. Yeah. You know, when I believed in signs being sent to me all the time, um, I didn't know how to function. You know, it's like, how do you read them? They're completely obscure. You know, it's like if God is sending us all signs, he's the, he needs a PR director. Well, if you uh, look at the whole picture, uh -huh. not just cherry picking out the things that you right. think, right. You, the whole picture is this. If you extrapolate that model of the universe or God manipulating things, what you have is a God or a universe whose actions are completely indistinguishable from random acts. Yeah. Uh, oh, this is good and it's God. This is bad and it's God. This is good. And, uh, this mm -hmm. is indifferent and it's God. It no. becomes mm -hmm. a dull gray. No. Um, you know, and so it's knowing and accepting physical cause and effect means that I can function and it's because it's real. If there really were a God who was sending signs and it's like there were really clear notes, it's like Greta, go get ice cream today or eat vegetables today and that was and that God existed and that was a clear message, then yes, I would want to believe that because that would guide how I could live my life. But it's not true and it is so confusing. Assuming he's not actually trying to kill us. Assuming he's not we, actually we trying to, to kill us that or that he's not like some sort of trickster spirit who's <laughs> like, you know, messing with us on purpose. Yeah. David in Hackensack, thanks for waiting. You've got me and Greta. Hi, Matt. Hi, Greta. Thanks for taking the call. Um, my issue is this, is I'm an atheist, uh, and I find uh, that I'm very interested in politics, but that we as an atheist group um, aren't a group. We are kind of peppered all over the United States. And I'm calling, you know, with a, with a kind of a... a, a I'm trying to find the word, but uh, it concerns more the United States than I guess, you know, the world. But how can we come together as a group of atheists so that we would have more political power to get change enacted? Um, there are uh, politicians now that are looking for the black vote, the Jewish vote, the uh, evangelistic vote and so on, but you never hear about anybody going after the atheist vote. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you really have an answer to this, but I'm just wondering if there is any sort of um, answer to getting atheists together as a group. I would love to take this. Go, go right, right ahead. And right. actually, I'm going okay. to let you go, David, and we'll take it offline because there's a limit to how political we can get anyway. So. Right. Um, okay. uh, so I will, it, yeah, and, I, and I'm not going to endorse any candidates because I know I can't do that. Uh, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about LGBT history because we had the, we've had exactly the same issues. It's like we don't, you know, when uh, uh, LGBT people were trying to organize and get a political agenda enacted, we don't all agree about everything. We don't all agree about what our priority. Even when we do agree, we don't agree about what's more important. Even if we do all agree that same-sex marriage is important and adoption rights are important and employment rights are important, uh, we don't always agree about which is more important. Uh, we don't agree about tactics, about how to get our agenda across. And yet, we have been incredibly effective. You know, when, when, when I was born in 1961, Gay people were still being put in mental institutions and being lobotomized and given shock treatment. And now we're getting legally married. Um, the, I had no expectation that that would happen in my lifetime. I, I, I not only no expectation, but it didn't even occur to me to imagine it. And so I think we have a lot to learn from the history of the LGBT community. Um, there's some important differences as well. But one of the most important things is that Atheists sometimes think that having an atheist movement means we all have to agree, that we have to have 100% agreement. If we don't 100% agree about something, then, you know, and of course, the only thing we 100% agree about is that we don't believe in God. And there's not much of a political agenda to be had there. So what we need to be able to do is, first of all, respect and accept that we do have differences and allow different 
groups and subgroups to organize differently, to have, okay, we're going to have one group that's working on same-sex marriage, we're going to have another group that's working on employment rights. We're going to have one group that's more in your face, more street activism, uh, more, you know, more confrontational, and we're going to have other groups that are more diplomatic and, you know, uh, trying to work with people and make compromises. Um, so we don't all have to agree uh, in order to do political action. We can have differences. Um, and we shouldn't be insisting that we have to have 100% agreement or otherwise it's not really an atheist uh, agenda. Um, so that's, you know, that's obviously a very broad answer and, you know, I, you know, more specific answers, you know, I don't think we really have time for. But, um, um, but I actually think that the atheist uh, movement has an edge on the early days of the LGBT movement, which is that we have the internet. You know, I sometimes think about what would the LGBT movement be doing now if we had had the internet in 1969? And it just kind of makes me want to cry uh, because, uh, you know, we would be, uh, be so much farther than we are. Um, so um, what I would say is do... Um, get your atheist groups, local atheist groups, student or not student, uh, to do voter registration drives. Um, uh, try to form uh, atheist democratic clubs in your city. It's like there's a LGBT, couple of LGBT democratic clubs in San Francisco and they do things like endorse candidates. You know, if you have a democratic club that, uh, and there's going to be people who are saying, you know, not all atheists are democratics, Democrats, well, fine. They don't have to join the club. That's my point about we don't all have to agree uh, in order to, to have political representation. We just have enough of us agree. And if you have an atheist democratic club in your city and the politicians, you know, the mayor, the city council, uh, the state representatives, they know that you represent a certain number of, of voters and that you're doing voter registration drives, they are definitely going to listen. Um, so... Um, you know, it's, it's a very large topic, and I could talk about it for hours, uh, and we don't have time should. for it. But um. it's, it's one that should be easier than what it is, yeah. uh, because we all have to recognize right off the bat, uh, atheism, the one thing we agree on. Cool. The God thing. <laughs> uh, what the Atheist Community of Austin did, and we worked for quite a long time to do it, is there's a list of position statements. And the key factor to these position statements, which you can find at the Atheist Community website, atheist-community.org, is that you don't have to agree with every single one of them to be a member. The only requirement for membership is that you don't have a belief in a god. Ta-da! <laughs> um, but we have those position statements to talk about what the organization's going to do. And there's no pretense that the atheist community of Austin's position statements represent what every atheist thinks. It just doesn't happen. I mean, that's not the case. But the, here's the thing. I might, uh, at different times in my life, I have associated with different parties. Uh, and at no time did I ever agree with everything that was in the official party platform. And mostly, nobody expects that because they all know that's gay. Hey, I'm a Republican, green, green Democrat, you know, what libertarian. Uh, nobody, even because they've interacted with it. I'm a Republican, and I'm talking to another Republican, and we have disagreement. And yet we're still going to support the Republican Party. The same thing true with Democrats, libertarian, green, whatever. It's, it seems easy in the broad strokes to say, oh, of course we don't have to all agree. Mm -hmm. And yet when you get to a specific portion of the community that have united under something that's not necessarily a single political issue or platform, um, they're not a voting block. They're, the, nobody's going to come after the atheist or secular communities as a voting block until there's reason to view it as a voting block. Mm -hmm. Whether that ever happens, I, I don't know. But if it were to happen, it would have to be something like what Greta was talking about, where we recognize that not every secularist has the same views. But because you can find atheists who don't support church-state separation. SC Cup. Uh, you can find atheists who not, not only don't support church-state separation, but uh, don't have a problem with pastoral exemptions for houses. or what. Hey, the churches, they brought us a hospital and a school, so we'll just let them. You know. There are people that do that. And until you actually get together as a group and say, here's our positions that we generally agree on, but not necessarily you know, black and white uniformly, uh, there's, no, there's no block for them to address. 
And that's why it needs to be issues based to start with, and those issues need to roll up under a label. We are, mm -hmm. we are the secular humanist for church state separation, the Freedom from Religion Foundation, Americans United for church state separation, which is headed by a, a non atheist, a non secularist. Uh, and that's the Reverend Barry Lynn, who I've shared a stage with and will happily share a stage with again while we're working on that common goal. Uh, and if it turns out the secular community or the atheist community can't get together on issues, mm -hmm. I'm happy to work with those other organizations focused mm -hmm. on the issues that I care about. Yeah. So. And I think one thing that is important to, to recognize is that there's no issue that we all agree on, except, of course, that God doesn't exist. But there's issues where we have a fair amount of consensus. I've seen some polling, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's early in the days of organized, atheism, of organized atheism really being as big as it is. So, you know, I don't know if this is going to pan out. But I've seen polling shows that there is, for instance, atheists are overwhelmingly pro-choice when it comes to abortion. Not 100%, but overwhelmingly pro-choice. That suggests that that's an issue on which we can, around which we can organize. You know, atheists are overwhelmingly uh, pro-gay rights. Um, uh, that's, that, that suggests that that's an issue we can organize about, especially because those are issues that do have to do with secularism. They're issues that were mostly the opposition to our positions comes from religion. Yes. Uh, and therefore, they're, it's perfectly appropriate for, for us to organize around. So I think that finding areas where we do have enough common ground um, you know, and again, parallels to, to, to history, not, not all you know, gays, lesbians, bisexuals, uh, trans people have agreed with every position that, um, you know, that every uh, advocacy organization for us, for us held, but enough of us did. You know, they, they, the advocacy organizations usually, <coughs> um, HRC, <coughs> um, usually do a pretty good job of taking the temperature of the community and getting a sense of where is there a consensus. Well, when we put together the position statements for the ACA, the foundational principle, which was part of our constitution, was church-state separation. Mm -hmm. And then we listed a bunch of positions that we had a strong consensus fell under church-state separation, whether it had to do with uh, science-based sex education, whether it had to do with individual rights and stuff like that. We are mm -hmm. almost out of time. Uh, I want to try to get to one call just because I think I can give a, a quick answer. Are you there, Mixie, in Florida? Uh, hi, Ann. You can hear me, right? Yes. Hi. Uh, I just have a couple of quick questions. I guess it's done last person. Um, the first question is, you once, were, you once were a Christian for about 25 years. Sure. What made you okay with having like cherry picking which laws you didn't didn't abide by sure so while i was a believer how was i okay with the contradictions and problems that i now reject right yes it was really easy god was real god was right i was a fallen being who couldn't understand it and so anything that i saw that was problematic was confusion on my part and you just had to trust that god knew you know, hey, the Bible, it, it's not necessarily perfect and correct. It was inspired by God, but, you know, maybe there's a scribal error somewhere. Maybe there's something about it that I don't understand because I can't see as far as God. All of those excuses, if you begin with belief uh, and you begin with the belief that God can't be wrong, it's trivial to dismiss any contradictions or problems. It's like if you, if you believe that God can do miracles... There's nothing remarkable about a talking snake or a talking donkey. I'm, to me, that, of course, <laughs> seems absurd now. But if you begin with, you know, God can do anything, well, of course a snake can talk or a donkey can talk or a bush can burn without mm -hmm. consuming, you know. Mm -hmm. It's all about the preconception. And the other question is, is uh, I could so easily be wrong on this, but I believe I once heard you said, um, when somebody asked that you didn't believe that the earth was created from the Big Bang, and if this is correct, how do you think it was created? I don't think the earth was created still. Uh, yeah, that was the question. Uh, and the earth wasn't formed from the Big Bang. It's not like Big Bang and then earth. There's billions of years in between. Um, but we have a pretty good understanding of how planets form from accretion disks of sun and uh, of stars and things like that. Um, so yeah, it's it's. Uh, does that answer your question? Not exactly. Like if it's not created, because I'm an atheist, I'm not advocating for uh, 
for religion, but if it's not created by something, you know, big bang, uh, divine being, etc., then how does how does something exist without being created? No, no, no. So, so I avoid the creation because of things like creation. And the correct question, and how you phrase the question is, what is the explanation for the origin of the earth? Because that allows mm -hmm. you to say, oh, it was created through this entirely physical process without any intelligence or guidance, or it was created by this being. Or you can say, ah, the earth appears like every other planet or under the models that we have to have been formed from the accretion disk of the star, in our case, the sun. Um, by way of gravity. So it, it's, it's the word creation that I'm removing from this entirely. And this is, I remember a call that came in when somebody was like, hey, if God didn't create the universe, who did? <laughs> yeah. And, and, and so if you ask the wrong questions, you, if you ask the wrong questions, you have very little hope of getting to the right answer. The, the, the correct question is, what is the explanation for the origin of the universe? And the answer is, we don't know, but we have some, you know, potential models. We, we don't have a time machine, um, but, you know, the Big Bang cosmology represents the best explanation based on the current evidence, which is affirmed by observations of cosmic microwave background radiation. Um, and why would anybody call uh, a couple of non-scientists to ask them for the explanation of this? <laughs> but... Yeah, on that note, we're about out of time. I appreciate the call, Mixie. I want to get to one more that maybe Greta can address, but we'll run slightly over time. But uh, Cody's been waiting for a while. Cody and Champagne, you had a question about skepticism. Yeah, hi. Hi. Um, so a little while ago, I sat down with a couple of Christians, and uh, we got on the discussion of the um, cosmological argument, the whole thing coming from the Big Bang, uh, uh, obviously, he was arguing that the source was God, and I was saying, I mean, we can't know that. So um, it ended up getting into, I mean, he tried to defend it, talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, um, <clears throat> talking about, you know, the different arguments that he had for why it would be a God. And um, I had told him that I didn't, you know, think those were good. Uh, that I was being skeptical and that I didn't think that we had enough information. Um, okay. So he ended up accusing me of being uh, too skeptical. And that Then he doesn't understand what skepticism is. Of, <laughs> uh, he was kind of making the point that, like, uh, it ends up getting to the point where if you're too skeptical, you can't even uh, justify your own existence type of thing. So I was wondering, like, I mean, is that valid? Where do you draw the line? Um, yeah, so, so that's, that's somebody who, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. That's somebody who doesn't no, 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 understand no, no, skepticism. Okay. Um, the, the way they're viewing skepticism is as if it were just an expression of doubt, that the entirety of skepticism is, I doubt this. And, and so they have this, yeah. this view that, oh, I can keep presenting information, but you can just doubt that, and you doubt that, and you doubt the foundation for that, and you doubt the, and you get into this infinite regress, and bam, you can't even know whether or not you're real or you exist. And you know what? At a really simplistic, regressive, philosophical level, they're right, but that's not what skepticism is. The, the, the goal of skepticism is to have the internal model of the universe or reality, match reality as best as possible. It, it doesn't require absolute certainty. As a matter of fact, I would say that most skeptics like me reject the notion of absolute certainty and that what we're doing is mm -hmm. taking the best evidence and saying, is this sufficient for me to hold a belief? And, and as Hume pointed out, the wise man apportions his belief to the evidence. So I might be somewhat convinced that this is the case based on the evidence. I might be strongly convinced that this is the case. Is it possible to be too skeptical? No, because skeptical isn't just, I'm going to keep expressing doubt. That's cynicism. That is, nope, 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 not enough, not enough, not enough, not enough. Skepticism is about <laughs> establishing the bar on what quantity and quality of evidence should be sufficient to warrant reasonable acceptance of a claim. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, what I would say to that right. is, there is this idea, I mean, there's lots of, lots of terrible ideas about what skepticism means, but there's one of those terrible ideas, is that skepticism means never drawing any conclusions. 
That skepticism never means I'm pretty sure that this is true. And you can't, you literally can't live like that. I mean, it would be impossible to live like that. Right. You know, that what skepticism means is drawing reasonable conclusions based on the best evidence you have, uh, based on the best understanding you have of your own cognitive biases and everybody else's cognitive biases, including the cognitive biases of people who are giving you information, drawing the best conclusions you can and being willing to question those uh, exactly. when better evidence appears. And, you know, there is a, on a purely practical level, there's a certain point at which it's like, okay, how many times do I have to re-ask this question? You know, it's like, I at this point, you know, I feel like I've been talking with believers about the arguments for gods for years now and I think I've heard all the arguments I, I don't think anybody is at this point gonna come up with an argument that I haven't heard uh, you know it's like there's somebody once said on my blog that you know it's if there's a really great argument for for, for God why isn't that the one they're using yeah. you know it's it's you know so so at this point on a practical level I'm probably not really gonna. If somebody says, "Oh, why don't you consider the po- have you considered the possibility you're, that you're wrong about God?" Yes, I've considered that and I've rejected it. Um, and yes, if somebody came up with a really amazing conclusion and lots of atheists around me were going, "Oh, you should really read this because this is this is good. Uh, you really need to consider this." Um, but it doesn't mean we can't come to reasonable conclusions. It means that we should be willing when. And that we should be willing to know when our evidence isn't great, you know, to, to say, you know, right now the research on this particular issue is not good and it is still kind of shaky and we need, I need to, we need to be re-questioning that versus, you know what, gr- heliocentrism, I'm not really going to seriously question right now. We, we have studied and studied and studied that for, for centuries now and we're, we're pretty sure. Um, um, you know, and and so my confidence about that conclusion is is based on on that level of of, of evidence. What what your friend is trying okay. to do is get you to say, hmm, maybe I should lower my standards of evidence sufficiently yeah, so that I could accept the conclusion that my friend has accepted. Mm-hmm. And the way to address that, in my opinion, is to say, okay. Let's define your standard of evidence and see how many things you don't believe that would also fit underneath that bar. How many other religious claims from religions you reject would meet that same standard of evidence that you're doing? How, it, you, once you expose that, you've exposed that they are unreasonable, that they are in a state of cognitive dissonance, that their standards are not sufficient to have a good understanding of, of truth and, and reality. And that exposes the flaw, and it also simultaneously has the benefit of explaining why your bar is so much higher. Why you want, hey, you got to get over this, you, or, or it's not good enough. Because the beliefs matter. Beliefs inform your decisions, they inform, inform the actions that you take, and those actions have consequences on all of us. And so if your bar is low enough that almost any evidence can, can, is sufficient to clear it, yep, I believe in that, that is defined as gullibility. And as soon as you have a method, if you have a method of discerning the truth that can simultaneously lead to two mutually exclusively contradictory positions, your method is fucked. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what skepticism is all about. Yeah. Let's not fuck up the method. No. But on that note, I thank right. you. We've, we've got to go. We've run over time. Thanks so much to my friend and guest today, Greta Christina, and all thank the you. people out there watching at home and on the other side of the glass. Uh, Backers weekend went amazing. I was so happy to have you here. It was awesome. And uh, so we'll look fun. forward to seeing you next time. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Hi, this is Russell Glasser, host of The Atheist Experience. 
You know, the Atheist Experience is made possible by volunteers and the generous support of viewers like you. If the promotion of positive atheist culture and separation of church and state are values that you hold, please consider contributing by becoming an ACA member or visiting our product page at EvolveFish.com under the Partner tab. Thank you.